Good morning, everyone. It's a joy to have you joining us uh, for another Sunday school hour here at Trinity Baptist Church or from home. We are looking at uh, God's name, one of God's attributes as described in Scripture in uh, a number of sections. This is the second Sunday when we are looking at God who has revealed himself to us in Scripture by various names, and one of the names he has revealed himself by is the name Jealous. Let us pray as we start. Our Heavenly Father, we are very grateful for the gift of life, for having preserved us from last Sunday and gathered us here we come this morning to worship you. We do recognize how that unless you help us, we will be distracted. We are so easily uh, distracted by many things, by many cares. And Lord, we do not desire to, to be distracted as we worship you this morning. We would want to focus on you in spite of whatever issues or uh, whether pressures or pleasures that are in our lives, we please ask, therefore, O oh God, that you'd help us to think your thoughts after you. Please help us to investigate your word, to understand your word, to hold on to your word, to hold on to it with high honor, and then to apply it. We please ask that we be both hearers and doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we began looking at uh, this Sunday school session on the God whose name is Jealous. Uh, James, could you give me the click? I could just, sorry, sorry, media team. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Harvey. We began looking at this Sunday school class on the God whose name is Jealous, and we were telling ourselves a number of things, that if we ever get to know God, we need to understand that it is a privilege. We are finite, he is infinite. We are created, he is uncreated. We cannot sit down somewhere and hammer out in our mind a concept of who God is and be successful. So God, knowing God, is a privilege. It's a privilege that he gives us as he discloses himself to us. He accommodates himself to us and speaks to us, sort of does baby talk with us, so that then we may be able to understand who he is and the implications of that. And so in this Sunday school I'm focusing on God's name, the, the name Jealous, and I reiterate, it's a privilege, and I want us to realize that, that I've already talked about the fact that it's a privilege because God discloses himself. I want us to realize that we are terribly impoverished if we fail to know God by any of his revealed attributes. So part of what we will be looking at as we go on is in what ways are we impoverished and in what ways are we made rich, enriched either when we fail to know God as he's revealed himself, the God who is jealous or whose name is jealous or when we get to know him as he has revealed himself. We looked at a number of texts of scripture last week that did show us that this is not an isolated uh, thing that, uh, uh, or name that God uses in describing himself. In Exodus 20 verse 5, as he gives the second commandment, he does say that, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. In Exodus 34, 14, and we are going to focus a lot on Exodus 34 today, he does say that he is 
the Lord whose name is jealous and he is a jealous God. In Deuteronomy 4.24, we did say, see how scripture says, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Deuteronomy 5.29, you shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. We, we did see these texts. Deuteronomy 32, 16, they stirred him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations, they provoked him. We saw a number. Joshua 24, 19 is a solemn one. Joshua basically telling people who are saying, we are going to serve God, we are going to worship him, we are committed. And he tells them, Joshua said to them, you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. And so we saw a number of these texts, and we even saw in, in, in the necessity of this subject, we did appreciate that this subject is necessary for a number of reasons. This is not just something that we are doing to occupy this one-hour space that we have. We did see that that if we are to grow in communion with God, if we are to grow in wisdom, if we are to boast rightly, and if we are to have faith, which is a critical foundation for our relationship with God, and if we are to have eternal life, we must know God. So today, having looked at the necessity uh, of this subject, I would like to invite us to consider Exodus chapter 34. Kindly turn to your copies of God's Word. In Exodus 34, we will camp there for these 50 minutes. And so roll up your sleeves. We are going to investigate these texts as those who appreciate. This is a life or death thing, okay? This is so important for me as an individual and for us as a church that I don't want to be left behind. If I'm feeling like I'm being left behind, I'll say, hey, Musiniache, please don't leave me behind. Kindly explain, or that seems to be contradicting this other portion of God's word that seems to be saying this, I need help. Okay, we are together. So Exodus 34 then, um, this is what God's word says. I'll read it from the projection. The Lord two tablets of stone like the first, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke. Be ready by the morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No one shall come up with you and let no one be seen throughout all the mountain. Let no flocks or herds graze opposite that mountain. So Moses cut two tablets of stone.
break their pillars and cut down their asherim. For you shall worship no other god, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and when they whore after their gods and sacrifice to their gods, and you are invited, you eat of his sacrifice. And you take of their daughters for your sons, and their daughters whore after their gods, and make your sons whore after their gods. You shall not make for yourself any gods of cast metal. You shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. For thee, in the month of Abib, you came out from Egypt. All that open the womb are mine. All your male livestock, the firstborn of cow and sheep, the firstborn of a donkey, you shall redeem with a lamb. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. All the firstborn of your son you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest time you shall rest. You shall observe the feast of weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. For I will cast out nations before you and enlarge your borders. No one shall covet your land when you go up to appear before the Lord your God three times in the year. Verse 25, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened, or let the sacrifice of the feasts of the Passover remain until the morning. The best of the first fruits of the ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And the Lord said to Moses, Write these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses, Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. Let's just ask God for help again. And sorry that the PowerPoint or the computer slept on us. Let's pray. Oh Lord, as we consider how you disclose yourself in this context of 
your word in Exodus 34 as the God who is, whose name is Jealous. We please pray that you'd open our eyes to the end that we would see wondrous things in your word. To the end, O oh Lord, that we would all leave this place saying, Oh, how we love your law. It is our meditation all day long. We please ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to invite us as we think about this text of Scripture, because it is within this context in verse 14 that we've seen God saying, For you shall not wo you, for you shall worship no other God, for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Now I am inviting all of us to study this context because it is within this context that God is revealing himself this way. And let us ask ourselves two questions. What is this meeting that is taking place? And then let's ask ourselves questions about the message, or should we say the messages, that the Lord is sending forth to us within the context of this meeting where he reveals himself as the God whose name is Jealous. You'd notice in verse 10, he is saying, Behold. And at times we rush, but the word behold begs that we slow down, isn't it? Behold. When God says behold, we slow down. Because he's saying, take a look, observe, relish this fact. Behold, I am making a covenant before all your people. I will do marvels such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of the Lord, for it's an awesome thing that I will do with you. And so God is saying, there is something happening here. I am doing a work. I'm doing a work for you. I'm doing a work in you. I'm doing a work through you. This is the context within which he is going to say, I am a jealous God. He is saying there is something going on here. Let's wake up and realize there is a work being done. And it is a work that going, God is going to showcase not just to the people among whom the work is going to be done, but even amongst those that do not experience this work. Okay? And he's saying you will see it, and those who are not experiencing this covenant will also see it. It is within this context that God then says, realize I am very serious about this thing. I am a God whose name is Jealous. Now, having done that, let's go back to verse 1 and ask ourselves, what's this meeting? What's taking place here? Why are we having this record in Exodus chapter 34? So look at verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Cut for yourself two tablets of stone, like, like the first. Okay? So that hopefully helps you realize what context we are talking about. Does anyone want to chime in to help us re, uh, just capture what's happening? What's happening here? Brother Paul, thank you, Ken. Uh, the setting is, you have to begin from chapter 32. Okay. When Moses had gone up to the mountain mm -hmm. and God was giving him the law, the, yeah. the law of the covenant. Okay. But then down there at the bottom of the mountain, the people are thinking Moses has died. He has gone up into the mountain. Okay. And so they push or rather they convince Aaron mm -hmm. 
to lead them and to give them a god. Okay. So Aaron makes a calf, and as he says, mm-hmm. as he tells Moses in chapter, I think, yeah, in just that chapter 32, he tells them that I threw all this gold into the fire and this calf came out. Okay. So they were worshipping it. All right. And Moses broke, Moses was coming down with the stones and he threw them down and broke them mm-hmm. because they had broken the covenant. All right. Then Moses intercedes for them, for the people. After having punished them, mm-hmm. he intercedes for the people. Mm-hmm. And so now, yeah, inter- and God says, okay, fine, I'm not going to destroy them. Mm-hmm. And so now God is telling Moses there, uh, cut out stones for yourself. Like the first one. Like the first one. All right. So the context is happening in a setting where people, would it be fair to say they distrusted God? When Moses had gone away for a long period of time, we can use, the people were fearful. Uh, or they lacked faith in Exodus 32. And after Moses had stayed for a while, they thought, he's not coming back. He is not coming back. We are afraid he is not coming back. And so they, they make the golden calf. What was their intention in the golden calf? Was it that they were now deciding God no longer exists? We are going to create our own new God? Was that their intention in Exodus 32? Brother Paul shakes his head. Anyone of a contrary opinion that those people had gotten to a place in Exodus 32 where they were saying God no longer exists. Remember they've just crossed the Red Sea. They've seen the plagues in Egypt. Okay? So they are now on the other side of the river. What, what, what was their motivation with the calf? Ken is bringing you the microphone. Verse 4. Yeah, verse 4 of chapter 32 says, And he received the gold, that is Aaron, he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Okay. When Aaron, yeah, so I would say that they wanted they were saying that they're worshipping the God who brought them out of Egypt through that calf. Yes, in fact, it's clear in verse 5. Because in verse 5, when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to who? To the calf? You see verse 5 of Exodus 32. So when they had the golden calf, their intention was worshipping who, according to verse 5? Yahweh, isn't it? So they were using a wrong means to worship the true God. Are you seeing the context, dear friends? And so, and, and then it led on, it began this way, but it led to licentiousness and debauchery. It, it began as we are gathering to have a feast to God, Okay, and we will worship God with the representation of this golden calf, but then it slid into debauchery as it always does. Were these people ignorant about the fact that that was a prescribed thing? Were they ignorant that God had not allowed them to worship him in this way? Had they been left to grope in the dark with regards to, is it okay to worship the one true God using the golden calf? No, they were not, isn't it? And how do we know that? The Ten Commandments, Brother Harvey, if you go to to Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, is it verse 5? Yeah, 
Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is on the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. In that commandment, worshipping the one and true God using means that are not accepted is not allowed. It's not just enough for you to say, I am not breaking the first commandment, which says you shall have no other gods before me. Okay? But it's also not allowed that we worship the one true God using graven images, representations of things either in heaven or on earth. Going back to Exodus 34 then, that's, that's just to help us appreciate why we are having we are having a second set of stones being cut. So these people have been involved in sort of the exchange of vows because that's what's really happening in Exodus 20. God has, a, has an exchange of, if you like, wedding vows with the people whom he owns both by right of creation and redemption. He owns them because he created them, and he owns them because he has redeemed them out of the house of bondage in Egypt, isn't it? And then he makes a vow with them, and the people basically say, we will obey, we will keep the Ten Commandments. And before long, they are breaking it, and Moses now he's back up the mountain. So part of what we are seeing in, the, in, the, in this meeting is, is there's been a terrible thing that has happened. It's within that context that God will reveal himself as the God who is, whose name is Jealous. All right. Now also notice something. That one of the big things that happens in this chapter is, is there's a mediator. Isn't that clear? Because Moses goes up the mountain and he's actually told the others are not coming up. And while he is there, he, he's told very clearly in verse 3 that he would be doing this alone on behalf of the sinful people who have remained at the bottom of the, of the mountain. There is a very clear mediatory role that God uh, here appoints Moses to do on the behalf of the children of Israel. Those, that's another thing that you see within this meeting. And then in this meeting, the Lord reveals himself to the nation of Israel through Moses. And he, he tells Moses, this is who I am, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting iniquity, the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and the fourth generation. At this point, Moses bows down and we've seen that beautiful covenant being made. Behold, verse 10, I'm making a covenant before all your people. And he says, I'm going to do marvels. I'm going to do wondrous things. I'm going to do fearful things in your midst, such as have not been created in all the earth or in any nation. This is going to be unique with you guys. And all the people among whom you are shall see the work of Yahweh. For it is an awesome thing 
that I will do. Then he says, and there is, it's important, dear friends, at this time, that when God begins to give the commandment in verse 11, we appreciate something. We live at a time when people seem to suggest, either by what they say or by their behavior, that grace and law cannot be together. They cannot go together. That if God is gracious to anyone, then the laws of God are thrown away. It's as if it's either or. But Scripture throughout the Old and the New Testament makes it very clear that grace and law have a sweet communion, as, as we would say in, in, our, in our confession. There is a sweet union between the grace of God and the commandments of God. Why is there a problem? Why do people struggle with, with uh, grace and law? And what are some of the consequences of people who try to say those two are mutually, mutually exclusive? Yes, Martin. I think uh, grace and law in the context of uh, justification has mm. uh, many, many people don't understand that uh, you cannot fulfill, fulfill the law for you to be saved, but after you are saved by the grace of God, you need the law for your sanctification. Mm. Okay. And do we need the law before we are saved? The law, I think in Romans says that is to make us aware of our sins. Okay. So yes. the law is a schoolmaster yes. that drives us to the gospel, isn't it? Yes. And then when we go to the gospel, we are enabled to keep the law. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Th those two go together. Dear friend, if you've been struggling with that, Hopefully you'd see in Scripture that the God who is gracious, he should have destroyed these people. He is merciful to them. He has clearly been very merciful to them. They should have been destroyed. They have violated the second commandment. And they have done so not so long after they have seen wondrous things. The Red Sea opening the firstborn of Egypt dying. They've seen all these things. And before long, they are shaking their fists at God. God would have every reason to destroy them. But there has been the intercessory work that God has responded to as Moses has cried out to God and God has listened to Moses' mediatory plea on the behalf of these people who have been redeemed out of the house of bondage. And that merciful God now gives a command. And he says, I command you this day, I will drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So what's the command there? So he's saying he's commanding them this day. Your knowledge of scripture. So he's telling them, I'm commanding you this day. Then he follows it with, behold, wake up and see. I'm driving out the enemies of God, those who deny you having the rest that you should have having been redeemed out of the house of bondage. What is he commanding them to do? I think the context would help us. Yes, yes, Martin. I think verse 13 can, can help. Mm -hmm. That you shall tear down their altars and break their pillars and okay. cut down their asherim. Okay. So they are idols. So there are things he's going to require them to do 
But before he even requires them to do it, he says, I'm, I'm, behold, I will drive them out. Okay? So it's not God calling on us to go and build bricks without straw. Are you seeing that? It is the beautiful that thing that we see in Philippians that we are to work out our salvation with fear and with trembling. And what's our enablement as we do that? Yes, thank you, Pasi. It is God who is at work in us, both to will and to do according to his pleasure. These truths are there throughout Scripture. He is telling you, you have a responsibility to do verse 13, to tear down. You have a responsibility in verse 12 to take care not to enter into any association, wrong association with sin. He makes those things very clear. But before he gives you the command, he reminds you that he is at work enabling you to defeat the enemy. So this was the meeting. This was the meeting that took place and there are various messages, and we've actually sort of begun crossing into the messages that we see in, in this meeting, the context where God reveals himself as the God whose name is jealous. Let's ask ourselves contextually, what would be some of the things we learn about this attribute of God, the God whose name is jealous? instead of taking that name and putting it under a microscope, what I'm trying to do is let's study that name within the context where God reveals himself as the God who is jealous. Can I tell you one lesson that I learned? That this attribute of God without a mediator is one that I would not safely know. Does that make sense? Without Jesus Christ, without Jesus Christ, the picture of whom we see in Moses, who reveals that attribute to the nation, without the Lord, I would not want to come face to face with the God who is jealous. Because you remember what we saw in Joshua chapter 24? In Joshua 24, Joshua said, you can't serve God. And that was to a people who are saying we are going to serve God. And he told them, you can't. Joshua 24, 19. But Joshua said to the people, you are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. So one of the things that one receives as a message from Exodus 34 as God is revealing himself as the God who is, whose name is Jealous is you thank God for the mediatory work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Knowing our sins, our rebellion, having seen all the wonderful things that God has done as he has been delivering us out of the house of bondage into the promised land. And yet, before long, we are going the way of those who do not know God, who do not want to, to... I mean, it would be a serious thing to meet the God who is holy, and who tells us in the second commandment that he would not fail to hold us guiltless. You shall not bow down, Exodus 25, to them, for I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers on their children to the third and fourth generation of all those who hate me. So that's one of the messages. For me, the other message about the God who is jealous 
from this context. He's a God who is jealous. He's a God who pursues his redeemed to preserve them and to help them do his will. He says, I'm going to do this. So even when he's giving us the work to do, it is because he has already committed to do it. His commands, his bidding to us as the God who is jealous is a thing that he superintends over and empowers us to accomplish. He has not left us on our own with regards to being faithful to him. Yes, we have a responsibility to gouge out that right eye that causes us to sin, to chop it off our right hand and throw it away if it causes us to sin. But we are not left to do these things on our own strength. He is available to help us. God is committed to his people. And as we look at the rest of the chapter, you will see he is committed to ensuring that we love him exclusively, that we trust him, and that we commune with him. And you would see these three things coming over and over and over again within this text, even when he is saying, take care lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, in verse 12, you can clearly see he's saying, don't commune with people in that land. Don't enter alliances with them. The God who is jealous is saying, I am to be the one whom you love, the one whom you trust, the one whom you commune with. We go through the rest of the chapter and just see how these things come off uh, to, to show these three things. Let's see verse 17. When he says, you shall not make for yourself any gods of cast metal. Which of these three things? Are we dealing with all of them perhaps, isn't it? Right? You shall keep the feast of the unleavened bread. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the time appointed in the month of Abib. For in the month of Abib you came out of Egypt. So what's happening there? The people are saying thank you, isn't it? They are commemorating what the Lord did as he delivered them out of the land of, of Egypt. They are freed. They've been freed, but there is something they are required to consistently do in the context where God has revealed himself as the God whose name is Jealous. He's saying, I want you to consistently do this in remembrance of what I did when I delivered you out of the land of Egypt. And dear friends, it is not hard to see New Testament fulfillments of these things, isn't it? In what way do we today commemorate in a similar way the work of God in delivering us out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of bondage? Yes, yes, Paul. I would say through the sacraments, the baptism and the Lord's Supper, baptism, both baptism and the Lord's Supper remind us of Christ's redemption. Okay. Yeah. The sacraments. And so a Christian who is saying, I am part of the bride of Christ. I am his spouse, so to speak, and who yet neglects some of those very basic things as what we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
as the Lord says, do this as often as you take it in remembrance of me, is, is one who is provoking God to jealousy. Because you see this in that context. It is very clear. It is a careless thing for me and for you to neglect the New Testament fulfillment that is the Lord's Supper. And then see verse 19. All that open the womb are mine. All your male livestock, the firstborn cow of cow and sheep, the firstborn of a donkey, you shall redeem with a lamb. I'm so thankful a donkey is redeemable. But let me not go there. Or if you will not redeem it, you shall break its neck. I'm so thankful that a lamb could redeem a donkey such as I. All the firstborn of your sons you shall redeem, and none shall appear before me empty-handed. And I think there is a New Testament, again, fulfillment of that. Today we don't, we don't bring into, into God's house a lamb to redeem a, a firstborn donkey or a firstborn son. But there is something here about how we see the material things that God has given us, isn't it? There is a clear message here. As God is saying, I'm the God whose name is Jealous, he is within that context telling you, hey, what's your relationship with the material blessing that I give you? Do you give God from the top or from the leftovers, isn't it? And I know there's been a lot of misuse of people in the area of how we serve God with our material uh, gifts. But scripture speaks to the issue. We will not be those who throw away the baby and the bathing water. Whether it is in 1 Corinthians 16, right after talking about the resurrection, it talks about how we serve God with our material blessings. Or whether it's in 2 second, second Corinthians 8 and 9, it also very clearly there talks about how we are to give to the Lord. And the Lord is saying, you know that you are a spouse of the God who has revealed himself as the God whose name is Jealous. You better have a proper relationship with the gifts he gives you. It is a sad day when a husband brings a rose flower home, a bouquet of flowers, and gives them to his dear wife. And the wife falls in love with the bouquet of flowers and forgets the husband. Begins having conversations with the bouquet of flowers and totally forgets the giver and now has a relationship that neglects the giver. Now he ha she has a relationship with the gift. And we so many times are like that. Um, look at verse 21. Six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. And then he says, this will happen in plowing time. And in harvest time, he takes the two most demanding seasons when you may have had an excuse for saying, uh, this commandment will not apply to me. The God whose name is Jealous, without that context, tells you, when I make time for you, you better be available. Because we... We, we have had time to interact over this. The Lord's Day is a day when we relish the privilege of God making time for us, isn't it? Special time for you. And he is saying, it does not matter when. And I do know that within the broader scripture, there would be what would be works of necessity, but look at what scripture is saying there. Plowing time, harvest time, 
Don't neglect the Lord's day. The God whose name is Jealous, as he is revealing himself to you and to me in Exodus 34, is saying, re, 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 neglect this at your own peril. I make time for you, ensure you are available for that time that I have made a deal for you. Any comment up to there? Even verse 23 does have the same vein. Three times in the year shall all your males appear before the Lord. And this is touching on the feasts. When the assembly of God was to gather to worship God, these people were required to show up. The God whose name is Jealous is heard again in Hebrews chapter 10 as he says, do not neglect the gathering together of believers as some are in the habit of doing. I have appointed this day when the assembly comes together to worship me. Ensure you come with the rest. Okay. Any thoughts, any comments, any additions, even corrections? Because I could be the talking head in front doesn't know everything. Yes, Martin. I think uh, I may add that uh, the context of all this nowadays mm. is in the church. Mm -hmm. the, the gathering, the covenant mm. is with uh, his people. Right. Who is the church? Who I, who, which is the church? Mm -hmm. And... If uh, someone is a believer and is not part of that, part of the body of Christ, so there's no way you can enjoy the Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, those sacraments we talked about, mm -hmm. if you are not part of the body of Christ. Yeah, because that's now the new covenant mm -hmm. is with the church. Right. Yeah. Yeah, these feasts were not being. It, it was not a global feast where all the nations, the ites, were attending. It was a holy convocation for the called out ones, isn't it? And what Brother Martin is saying, therefore, is very really important to us who are members of a local assembly and for those who are not members of a local assembly of Christians to join a biblical church where you say, I am a member of this family. Yes, yes, Brother Victor. I see you wanted to say something. No. Uh, maybe about the love of God there. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I think God wanted to, how, how he wanted them to truly be motivated to trusting in him and committing themselves to him and to surely cling to him. He first of all had to show himself so that in his jealousy, he displays his full power. He displays such a great, great power. Mm. As he says in verse 10 that uh, before all of you people, mm. I will do marvels. Mm. I'll do wonders. You know, awesome things, I will do them. Mm. And he says that such as have not been created in all, in all the earth. Mm or any nation. Mm. So he's displaying himself in such a way that truly the people will, as Exodus 50, 14, 31 says, Israel saw the great power that the Lord used against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord mm. and they believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Mm. So he's truly giving them such a powerful motivation and encouragement to cling to him and have no other God before before them because he is truly God mm -hmm. with such great and marvelous power. Right. Thank you, Victor. And so we are seeing a number of things that God is doing there. And let me just ask this question. I'm sorry if it feels too simplistic or redundant. Are they doing these things so that they are saved? Are these things requirements upon the nation of Israel so that they become those who are saved? The answer is no, isn't it? 
They are not doing this so that God saves them out of the land of Egypt. It's not that God is saying, do these things, then I will redeem you out of the land of Egypt. He is requiring it because they have already been redeemed. And they were redeemed by, by the blood of the Lamb, the Passover Lamb. And you, my dear friend, if you are a believer, have not been redeemed by silver or gold that even though refined still does perish. The Lord Jesus Christ shed his own blood and paid a debt you owed but could not pay. We need to draw to a close. Look at, look at some of the other implications. So, Verse 25, for example, and the implications on us as we preach the gospel, or even as we appropriate the gospel, you shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with anything leavened. Or let the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover remain until the morning. The God who is jealous is saying this, that the means of redemption, the grounds of redemption must be Jesus Christ and him alone. Not Jesus Christ and your Bible study. And I'm not saying your Bible study is not important. Okay? But at the end of the day, all your righteous works are filthy rags. And do not mix the blood of Christ with the leavened. As you preach the gospel, be careful. Be very careful in how you preach the gospel so that people do not think that it is Jesus Christ plus something else. It is Jesus Christ alone. It is sola Christus, isn't it? And that is very clear in this context where the God who is jealous he is revealing himself. He's saying, don't play with that. Because to play with that is to come face to face with the God who describes himself in verse 14. Be ignorant of that, and it is not some simple omission or mistake. It is a serious sin before the eye of the God whose name is jealous. And so when as a church we say we will not do anything popular as it may be out there that is contrary to Scripture or that is not revealed within Scripture when it comes to issues of the gospel, we stand there and unless we are biblically convinced otherwise, that would be the right thing to do. When we are serious about not manipulating people to come to the front with all eyes closed and with soft music playing in the background and repeating a prayer after the preacher, when we are that passionate about such things which are contrary to God's word because there is nowhere you'd find anyone being told, repeat this prayer after me in the Bible, it is because we take the God who has revealed himself as jealous seriously. It is in that context that he says, don't mix the gospel with anything else. It is the blood of the Lamb alone. Notice the next one. 26. These redeemed people are being told, how do you give? He says, the best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring to the house of the Lord your God. How do we give? Leftovers? Thoughtlessly? Inconsistently? The worst? of the last fruits, things that, as Malachi would say, even our earthly governors 
would not accept, lame, may God help us, may God help me to be one who realizes I'm married to the God who loves me and who deserves the very best and the very first of my very best. And not occasionally, not only when people know about it, but even secretly. When he says you shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk, a pagan practice that was for the purpose of fertility, and he's saying rely on me, trust in me, don't trust in pagan methods of succeeding as it were in life. Trust in me. And these things Moses wrote down. It is five minutes past ten. I ought to stop, but should there be a comment or question or correction, I would entertain it. Yes, Pasi. Um, I think one of the things that uh, we forget when we are dealing with the aspect of God being a jealous God mm -hmm. is that uh, it's not that uh, he feels his divinity is threatened by mm -hmm. idols. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not that uh, idols can in any way compete with the sovereign God. Right. Um, it's that he is jealous mm -hmm for his people, for the very best of his people, mm -hmm. um, having redeemed them. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he doesn't want them to go uh, in the way of perdition as the heathens are. Right, right. Um, when we tell someone that I'm jealous of you, mm -hmm. we are saying that uh, we desire the very best of you and uh, we are willing to do everything we can right. to care for you. Yes. So I think uh, that... Uh, that aspect need to be very well considered because there is a sense in which God is not jealous with regard to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he lets them wallow in their own sins and he hasn't redeemed them. He, isn't, um, he has not shown his special love upon them. But, but God is a jealous God insofar as his covenant community is concerned. Mm. Yes. Oh. The Lord is jealous for you. I don't know if you've had somebody who's come to you with some hard piece of information and ended up telling you, this, this is a thing I could have just gossiped uh, about instead of confronting you about it, but because I'm jealous for your well-being, I thought to go out of my comfort zone and confront you. And that's what Pastor Murungi is saying. Let's remember he is jealous for us for our good, for our eternal good, and for his glory. May the Lord help us as we spend the next two more weeks, Lord willing, looking at more implications of the privilege of seeing God disclosing himself as the God who is jealous, and the poverty that one falls into when they fail to concede the jealous, pursuing love, and merciful love of God, that the Lord would help us not just to be hearers, but doers of his word. Let's continue to interact over this, even in between uh, the services. And I need to apologize. I think publicly, Victor, you had asked a question about what I would do if I was a president. I thought I would interact on that matter during the week, but it was a fast week. I didn't get to do that. Forgive me, guys, for that. I'll try and do that in the course of the week. He, he had asked a question last week uh, with regards to the second commandment. Let's pray. Oh, God, we, we thank you for your word. If we were left on our own to guess these things about you, we would discover on Judgment Day, when it's too late, when there is nothing else that can be done to correct the situation, 
that we are numbered amongst those whom you never knew, those who may have been saying, we preached in your name, we prophesied in your name, but who would sadly hear, depart from me, you evildoers, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. We thank you for your word. And we thank you that while in past times you spoke in various ways, through prophets and visions and such other sources, today you speak to us through your Son, the Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who takes away our hearts of stone and gives us hearts of flesh, hearts that delight in our duty as the bride of Christ. We please pray for everyone here. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. We have been terribly neglectful in many ways. Help us, Lord, to see your love, your pursuing love. You should have destroyed us a long time ago when you were rescuing us from the house of bondage. You knew very well how we would, to our shame, fashion golden calves. And yet, Lord, you still chose to redeem us and bring us into your household. Help us not to take lightly this benefit, this debt of mercy that we owe you. Grant, O oh Lord, that uh, we would be contrite and that we would love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind and strength and love our neighbor as you have loved us. In Jesus' name we please pray. Amen. Amen.